What's up, listeners and people of YouTube? I'm Kyle Rocky. This is the Proposify Biz Chat. And on today's show, I'm talking to Michelle Weinstein, or Weinstein, a.k.a. the Pitch Queen. Uh, she, uh, we have a great chat. She's from San Diego. Um, she's been on Shark Tank. She tells us all about that experience and also on how to build rapport, especially if you're somebody who's a bit introverted and you find it hard talking to strangers. She gives us some great tips and strategies on how to kind of overcome your fear of talking to strangers, how to show genuine interest in people, and ultimately uh, develop leads in your pipeline through just, uh, you know, just getting out there and talking to people. It's really good. She also uh, is streaming this live on her Instagram account. So uh, you might hear us make a few mentions of that, but check out the episode. Let me know what you think. Um, let's talk about rapport to you. What's rapport to you, Michelle? You know, rapport to me is similar to like when we just got on the phone this morning. We're talking about, oh, where do you live? Oh, I'm in San Diego. You came out here for traffic and conversion. You're coming out here for social media marketing. We're really talking about nothing of what we scheduled our time today about. That's really building rapport. It's actually like generally caring about people, which I think most people don't anymore with the whole social media and all of the kind of fakeness that I call it. I call rapport that real stuff that you just don't do that often anymore. Yeah, for so, sure. And I think when you're in, you know, with all the services, that, businesses that you work with, building rapport for you guys is probably the biggest and best thing you can do to get the result, the end result that you're looking for. And let's say you're going to spend an hour with a client or a prospect or something like that. I would say 15 to 20 minutes should be about building rapport. It's not about what you sell. It's not about what you do. It, it literally has nothing to do about probably whatever you booked your appointment on. It's really about like, what did you do this weekend? Oh my God. Did you watch, you know, Kyle, did you watch the world series? Like how amazing were those games? Usually I fall asleep watching baseball, but I did not fall asleep watching baseball this season. And, you know, that's building rapport. What, what's interesting to Kyle? Kyle, why do you love coming to San Diego? You know, hey, we should meet up and have coffee and have lunch when you come out here. That is building rapport. It's starting to build that genuine business relationship. So when you do in the future ask for the sale, if you feel they're the right client, then they already sort of know you a little bit more than just this person who showed up. Key, I think the key there is genuine interest. I know I str I've struggled with this for uh, for the majority of my career and whatnot. Is my business partner is really good at building rapport, and I always ask him, "How do you just come up with conversations with strangers?" And and he's just like, "I'm just interested in people." So he asks them about what they do, and I think it's difficult if you're a little bit more introverted, um, and especially if you're trying to focus on sales. I know uh, I struggle with that a lot. Was yes. in the past was. You're, you kind of feel this pressure when you're at a networking event or a conference that you're like, I need to find people who are interested in my service. So you tend to sort of bypass the, the conversation and being interested in them as people. But it's such an important piece, isn't it? Yes. And for the introvert, um, if you share that link, it's an actual guide and it has questions that you can practice. And what I say is that you actually have to start practicing now because especially for introverts, it doesn't come as natural or you're a little bit more shy and maybe more reserved. And I always like to say there's ways that you can practice this today. If you go to Starbucks or you're going to go out to lunch or if, I mean, you have to leave your house to practice this stuff. So that's mm -hmm. step number one. Uh, step number two, though, is starting to ask and, you know, generally like care about something. Like if you think a guy, like I was just at Starbucks this morning. Okay. I went over there. And this guy has an amazing Tesla. Like this thing is my future dream car. It's, I, it's not the truck version. It is the truck version, but I want the car version. Same color, same everything. And I just started talking. I'm like, dude, do you work at Tesla? You, I mean, he kind of looks like he probably sells them. He's like, no. He's like, that is just my dream car though. And he's like, hey, you know what? If you ask for a demo car, you can actually save about $15,000 and I got it wrapped. Here's the place. I didn't even really need to say much, but I genuinely cared because I loved his car. It was not fake. That yeah. was real. And people can tell when it's real. So you just have to find those things that resonate with you that you see in somebody else. Because let me tell you, you never know where your next client might be. 
Yeah. This guy in the Tesla, if he would have told me that he manages a Tesla dealership and he needs someone to come help his sales team and, you know, maybe work on building relationships and rapport because they're not good at it, I could have gotten a new client. I'm just saying that your potential clients are in areas that you would never think. And building rapport and real relationships in the, I call it in the real life world, not in the online world, but for most of us in real life, that is the key ingredient to you, to a lot of success. And as an, I am not an introvert. I am a complete opposite, but for some reason I attract a lot of introverts. Like all, a lot of friends of mine are introverts and I do not know why. Well, but introverts can't attract other introverts because they won't I talk know. to each other. <laughs> they won't talk. You're right. That's so true. The introverts can't meet other introverts very easily because they'll just sit at home the whole time. I seem to drag the introverts out of their house, but you know, some of the introverts I know are some of the smartest people I know too. So you can comment on books. A lot of intro, do you read a lot of books, Kyle? I try. Yes. Yeah. So I do not read a lot of books. So I ask my introvert friends, like, which book should I read? Actually, which audio book should I listen to that you read? Cause I'm not going to read a book. And, um, you know, they give me really good insight. But as an introvert, you can have a different conversation with people when you're out and about that you can really help a lot of extroverts. But for you to strike up that conversation is going to take a little bit more effort and energy. But once you do and you see the result, it will be like amazing. You'll see. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. And I, 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 I think introverts sometimes get confused with just people who are quiet which or shy, which, you know, they can be the same thing. But a lot of people are amazed when they meet certain people. Like, I know when I tell people I'm, myself that I'm slightly more on the introverted side, they don't believe me. Um, but it is true. <laughs> a lot of introverts are better at public speaking, at better at a lot of things. Um, it just drains their energy. That's the right. only difference. It's yeah, it just drains your energy. I mean, you're good at a lot of the same things, but right after that, you need to go hang out by yourself for a while and read a book for a few hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of them are the best speakers that I've seen. It's pretty impressive. And that is not what an ex, like for me, that is not a skill set that I'm really great at. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, if you if you do the building relationships, I give you like step-by-step -step things that you can go practice like right now. Because everything takes practice. None right. of this is just going to happen overnight. Sorry. What are, right? some, what are some of those steps that you can take to practice? Uh, so the big one, I mean, is just like, where do you go? Let's, let's use you, Kyle, as an example. Where do you go every day or out and about? Uh, does work count? Uh, no. No work. Uh, I like to go to, there's a nice little cafe right near my house called Two If By Sea. It's the, it's the happy little hipster cafe that everybody in the okay. neighborhood goes to. Hipster cafe. Here's what you're going to do, okay? You're going to talk to the barista. They have a coffee bar, right? Yeah. And you're going to ask her what is her favorite drink. You want to, if you, no, you have to, you have to really want to know what her favorite drink is. But I really am interested by these people that work at coffee shops and what is their favorite drink. Because sometimes I get a new idea. For example, last week I asked that to somebody and they had a chai latte with espresso in it. It was called like a hammer chai latte or something. I was like, what does that mean? And they're like, it's a chai latte with two shots of espresso. I'm like, I want that. Sign me up. I want to try it. Let me see how it tastes. But I would have never known about that if I had not asked the question, right? So that's an example. Um, Maybe you're sitting on your laptop working next to a guy and you need the Wi-Fi password. Maybe instead of assuming you know the password, you just practice by asking, hey, I'm Kyle. Nice to meet you. I'm going to be here for a couple hours. Do you know the Wi-Fi password? Hmm. Just start asking basic questions because when you start to ask questions, that's when it'll get more comfortable. Right. And that is building a relationship because if he answers back, Hey, Kyle, it's nice to meet you. I'm Dan. And the password is hipster cafe. Oh, awesome. Cool. Thanks so much. You know, Kyle, what do you do? What are you doing here? They're going to start asking you, what do you do? What do you come here all the time? Ask him what he does. You have no idea, you guys, who you're going to meet. I have met investors on airplanes. 
I have, I have Ray, I, I met another guy with my last company on a plane. I pitched him and he said, Hey, I know Mark Cuban. I said, Oh, I was on Shark Tank. Can you send him a follow up for me? He sent him a follow up. This happened in a 45 minute flight from San Francisco to San Diego. When I tell you, you never know who you're going to meet. I'm telling you, you never know who you're going to meet. It's, it's mind blowing. And you make a good point about not discounting people. I think sometimes people have this picture in their mind of what a lead looks like or what an investor looks like or whoever it is they're trying to sell to. And so they go, if that person doesn't fit the mold, let's say it's a, uh, in, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kid who looks really young, a young guy who looks 18, oh, that could possibly be it. Well, maybe that's like Mark Zuck's you know, cousin or something or... Maybe it's an older lady who's in her 70s. And you're like, oh, that doesn't look like a good lead. Well, maybe she's this like seasoned business mogul. Like, you just never know, right? You never know. And what I, I don't know what the right term is for that, but it's called, um, I, I can't think of it right now, but it's a form of discrimination, okay? Right. Ageism? So, ageism, discrimination, whatever it is. And let me tell you something. I've been consulting with a company for the last five months, maybe six now. We have increased revenue by over 300000 maybe $340,000 in a very short time frame. They went from a sales cycle of 12 months to about a week to a day, depending on when we get the lead. They were, oh, pre-qualifying. They were pre-qualifying leads by a questionnaire sometimes that a lot of people don't answer correctly. People buy if you can solve their problems. And we were able to solve a lot of people's problems and they were thinking that because they didn't have this amount of revenue that they would not pay for their program, okay? So they are disqualifying on business revenue to get to, hey, will they spend X number of dollars on this program to help solve their problems? And what we found is that that actually has nothing to do with how someone's going to buy. And that is called discrimination of the leads or whatever. I say every single lead's a good lead. It's is the right person a good fit for you. And if the person is the right fit for you, then you make an offer. Now, if they're not a right fit, then you're disqualified. Oh, disqualifying. That's the word. Disqualifying, you're disqualifying yeah. them based on because they're not a good fit to work with you. That's different. Right. It's not right? A, an external factor like demographics or whatnot. No, it's not revenue, demographics, how much room do you have on a credit card. If people want what you have to solve their problem, they will go and make it happen. They will borrow money. They will find money. They will collect money from clients that owe them money. They will extend credit on a credit card because they see it as an investment in themselves and in their business, and it's a business expense and a write-off at the same time to work with you if you're able to solve their problem. So you can't dis, uh, what did I say? Discriminate disqualify. or disqualify. You can't disqualify based on what you think. Yeah. You have to give everyone a clean slate. And I, and I like to say it's like a, a, a dating relationship, right? Yeah. If you got screwed over, if I got screwed over by the last guy or whatever, I can't go into the next relationship thinking I'm going to get screwed over again and not give him a fair, clean slate. You'll so guarantee you never have a relationship again. Correct. Which you will guarantee you will never have a sale again if you treat the next person the same way you treated the person prior. You have to give everyone a clean slate and then you can disqualify based on certain things they tell you in a conversation or something like that. But every single lead is 100% a possibility as a client to you. Yes, absolutely. Right? We, we went through something similar at, uh, at my company where traditionally we're thinking, you know, a better leads are of a certain, there's a certain amount of employees or a certain amount of revenue per year. And it's actually people who have the problem we solve. They could be small companies and they'll still, you know, pay a certain amount of money to use our product if they have the pain of writing proposals. If they don't, it doesn't matter how big they are. They're never going right. to buy the product. Right. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Are people, this is a, uh, totally out of left field. Are people friendlier in San Diego? <laughs> um, I mean, I have been all over the country, world. People are going to be as friendly, as friendly as you are. So if you're standoffish and you're not very nice, guess what? You're going to get that in return. I, know, right? I noticed when I was in San Diego in February for the first time for the Traffic and Conversion Conference 
that everybody was friendly all the time. Like when I went to the grocery store, people were like just random strangers were helping me try to find products. I wasn't even asking for help. They were just jumping in and helping me. Uh, I'm Canadian. I'm, I live in Canada and right. the San Diegonians, I don't know what you call, <laughs> we guys call each other, were the like friendlier than anywhere I've ever been in Canada. San Diegans. San Diegans. That's, yeah. Good. Um, I've been to Canada, and I think everyone is super friendly. Okay. You haven't been to Toronto then? No, I'm just, for those listening in Toronto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been to Vancouver a lot. Oh, yeah. um, Hippy dippy there. Yeah. I, I really think what you project is what you're going to get back in return. Oh, so maybe I felt friendlier when I was in San Diego. Correct. Because you shining. were out of, sun was shining. That's a key ingredient to happiness. That's why I live here. Yeah. Um, but here, let me give you an example, okay? Uh, do you ever, like, uh, or I'll just give you a personal example. Sometimes I do some sales calls for people still, okay? And if I'm, like, in a slightly grumpy mood because yesterday it was cloudy out, sometimes I'll say, gosh, I wonder if this guy's going to show up to the call. Mm. Guess what? He doesn't show up to the call, Right. Or what about when you think about, I wonder if Susie's going to text me or like you start thinking about a person and then you hear from them. Mm. The friendliness factor is similar to that. It's like that, uh, what do they call it? The self-fulfilling prophecy yes. where what you think about will happen. Yeah. If you are in a good mood and you are all in like, you know, you had your espresso or chai, double espresso, hammerhead, whatever. And the sun is out like today, like I'm in a good mood. But the second the clouds come through, I get a little drifty and, you know, a little, <laughs> I, I, I'm not in as good of a mood. But <laughs> if I come to you in a good mood, I'm pretty sure that you're going to be in a good mood. If I come to you a little bit in a bad mood and frazzled and like not wanting to do this, guess what? You're going to be the same. So a lot of times it's a mirror effect. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, the weather really does have an effect on everybody's moods. Like you, I think you'll sell more as if, if you're outdoor, outdoors doing sales or any, like I used to do door to door actual like preaching work when I was growing up. Cause I was raised in a, a religion, wow. a religion where you had to go door to door and, and preach to people. And people were way friendlier when the sun was shining. If it was like cloudy or raining, you'd get a lot more doors slammed in your face. Yeah, well, I was like really depressed. After college, I lived in Seattle for three years. Um, I, that's where my family lives, and they moved up there. I, I quit my job one day and left. I went back to Arizona where I grew up, and now I ended up in San Diego. I cannot, I have to be around sun. And I've interviewed another guy, his name's Steve, and he, him and his wife had to move to San Diego because he was like really depressed in Chicago. So Chicago and Seattle, and they talk about people, you know, the death rate being high. I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, I, I had a regular job back then, you know, the cubicle-style job where you sit in a desk. It lasted three years too long, but I would go to work. It was dark. I would stay there. I would leave work. It was dark at, like, 4 o'clock. I mean, I don't know how people in Alaska, isn't it in Alaska it's sometimes dark almost all day? I think anywhere of a sort of of a certain northern hemisphere, right. like it's the same in Iceland or northern can like northern Canada. I could not do that. Yeah, it wouldn't happen. Nope, it won't happen. So I know it's rough. But <clears throat> well, I think you know, weather aside, we have a certain amount of control, and that's I think the takeaway for people is that it's a lot about inner game. If you think you're going to have a, a bad sales month, you're going to have a bad you sales will. month. Yeah. And a lot of it is your mindset and a lot of it, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to fix that, like meditation, you know, or affirmations at the gym, on the treadmill, I listen to some high frequency music and I say affirmations and I have to put myself in that place and, you know, one bad call or whatever can put you down for a second, but you have to get right back up because if you are an entrepreneur, business owner, you're in services, you're trying to grow your revenues and stuff. Sales is your livelihood. It, I mean, you have to be at the top of your game, but you have to practice the right steps to be at the top of your game. Yes, absolutely. You know, 
uh, like I mentioned earlier, I pitched on Shark Tank. I prepped for that for six months. And the day of the pitch, I still wasn't like I was there and it was in my subconscious. So I knew I'd be okay. Mm. But even that kind of stress level and, you know, opportunity, it, it, it's like, you know, speaking at, I don't know where, you know, let's say you were speaking at digital marketer with Ryan Dice or something. It would be like that. You know, you'd be nervous and all that, but you have to prep for it. Well, just like everyday sales calls in our work, you have to prep yourself for that too. So I do a lot of yoga. I do the silk stuff. I do stretching stuff for my head. I play lum- lumosity or luminosity, whatever you call that game. But I'm always working on the brain and doing things to help me at my craft. Because if we don't work on ourselves, how can you help other people? Absolutely. You can't. Uh- I want to go into helping people because you, you bring up a great choice, uh, a, a great point about showing up and offering value without offering anything in return. Just before we get into that, I, I, I want to know more about the Shark Tank, Tank experience. Can you tell, you know, walk us through that, what that experience was, how it came about? Yeah. So I had a company before called Fitzy Foods. It was a fresh prepared meal company. So I pitched on Shark Tank. It was season four. and um, my strength is in the sales area, right? So pitching, raising money. I raised over a million dollars uh, between debts and equity. I got our I got our products in Costco inside Vitamin Shop. So I've I've pitched to the big guys, and I I've always when Shark Tank came out, I watched like every single episode. I'm like, this show's cool. Now, I mean, they're what in season nine or ten now. So this is a while ago, and it was in the beginning of my last company. And I would say it was a little too soon, but they accepted me. 30,000 people applied. I was one of 140 that got the opportunity to pitch. Only two thirds actually made it to TV. So mine was one of the one third that never did. So I did all of that work as if it never happened. But Uh, it it actually was the best thing that ever happened to me. That experience. Oh, yeah. That experience. Shark Tank is like going to the Olympics for an entrepreneur. Mm. I made it to, uh, where is the Olympics coming up in 2020? I don't know where, but I, I I made it past the Olympic trials (laughs) and I made it to the Olympics and I had my chance for a gold medal, but it never aired. So I never got a gold medal, but that's not the point. The point is, is, yeah, the point is, is that the prep and the practice is the same that a track athlete would go to an Olympic training center and practice. I mean, I had all my current investors. We would do Shark Tank practice pitches here with my five different investors. They would be the sharks. They would answer, ask me questions. I would answer them. So uh, I was also in the food business, and I also knew none of the sharks knew anything about the fresh food business. Barbara was my only hope. Uh, so I did get her there that day. She loved our products, but it was very complicated food business. So it was a little too complicated for her, which I don't blame her. Um, fun fun fact, uh, before sharks tank, shark tank, it was based off of a Canadian show called dragon's den. Dragon's den. Yes. Kevin O'Leary was on that and a few other ones who came then to shark tank. Yes. Yes. Uh, Robert Hershevik. Robert Hershevik, yeah, and and the Canadian one had the guy I forget his name, but he is the he founded a big uh, chain called Boston Pizza up here in okay. Canada. So if you were up if you were pitching in Dragons, then you would have actually <laughs> had a food guy. <laughs> I would have had a food guy that would have helped me, but I knew the challenges that I had. We were just new, uh, you know, but it didn't matter. So what I did to prep for it is I watched every Shark Tank episode and made a full on spreadsheet that I still have today with what was the product, what was the offer, what were their revenues, what were their expenses, based on what I saw. You only see five to ten minutes of the show, but really the pitch is about an hour to an hour and a half. I was wearing high heels and my feet started to hurt. So that's how long it is standing in one spot. It was quite a while. But my point is, is that I prepped and prepared and prepped and prepared and prepped and prepared. I do the same today for my podcast. I do the same things for usually interviews, even though I was slightly behind and missed a sentence in your um, (laughs) thing you sent me. But I I always prepare as if it were for like Shark Tank. 
Okay. Yeah. So I have a presentation next week uh, with a bunch of entrepreneurs on my pitch queen system, the five steps that will help you in a sales process without being sleazy and being pushy. It's like all the 180 of what to do, not like that. And I've practiced. I did my presentation. I have a run through with a speaking coach on Sunday. Like I'm taking this really seriously, but that led to also presenting at monthly mastermind groups. So because I take everything as serious as almost the entrepreneurship of Olympics is what I like to call it. You're going to get opportunities like that again. So if you start to prepare yourself in your everyday work of whatever you're selling or servicing, as if it were the Olympics for whatever your industry is, the results you're going to get are going to be up here versus here. Yeah, absolutely. Does that make sense? Like I contacted, uh, so I had a coach, Cheryl Rouse. She has a company called Sparkle Presentations, and she helped me with my Shark Tank pitch. What do you do with your hands? How do you stand? How do you stand in high heels for over an hour in one spot? You can't move. There's like a little piece of tape. It's a red X on the carpet. Well, mm -hmm. they switched the set and you couldn't move. I mean, they made that like really a big point. And even getting onto Shark Tank, I would have to rip video record my pitch, send it to the producers or the, I think they're called producers. Yeah. And every week we had a check-in call. Hey, Michelle, work on this. Fix that. Okay. Do it again. I'd practice a hundred times video one, send it to them. They give you feedback. I mean, it was constant for months. Yeah. Wow. So that's just a snippet of that experience. It goes into way more detail, but it's not really all sales related. It was like how I got sent home three times and had to go back because I'm a local and they fly in people from around the country. Uh, and so I was close by their union. They can only tape eight people in a day. So if one or two pitches went over an hour to an hour and a half, that means that the union stops working at eight. Well, guess what, Michelle, you're back to San Diego. Maybe we'll call you again. Uh, and it was always maybe. You're like, if you've ever been on eggshells before, this is like the top of being on eggshells. So, <laughs> wow. You know, the closest I've ever come is, uh, you know, the show Wipeout, where people run along like an obstacle course and fall in yeah. water. They had yeah. Wipeout Canada like five years ago or somewhere was like the first you know, season one, Wipeo Canada, I applied and got shortlisted and I didn't make the cut. But I would have gotten flown like to, I don't know, South America to, to film the wow. Wipeo. So that's, my dream was crushed and I'll never <laughs> have a fulfilling life now because I didn't make it. Oh, wipeout. yeah. Well, you can try for, <laughs> you can try for another season. So for people that, for people that contact me about Shark Tank, if they didn't get selected, you know, I can give you feedback on it, but my whole thing is you have to be persistent. And when I got selected, I mean, I hit them up from all different angles, Twitter, LinkedIn, email, video, like all the angles. The only thing I didn't do was show up to an open casting call. I didn't do that. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, that really cool experience, Michelle, and uh, awesome, cool takeaways about how to build rapport and sell better and more effectively. So I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Uh, if people yes. want to check you out or follow you on online, where can they go? So on Instagram, the pitch queen, Facebook, it's the pitch queen. My website is the pitch Uh, it, this is how you spell it. it it's the pitch queen. See? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's my exactly hat. how it sounds. It's a cool hat too. Very yeah. sequins. Is there sparkles on that hat? That this one sparkles. My other ones are downstairs and I couldn't get them in time. But yeah, it's the pitch queen. If I can help at all, uh, you know, feel free to share the link in the notes. Uh, you guys can get the guide on the relationships. It really is really good. Yeah. Um, totally free. I've got a ton of free content on my website. Like I pretty much give away a lot for free. So have at it. And I think if you can just remember one of the biggest things is just how can you help serve the other people. And it has nothing to do with you. And when you can remove yourself out of it, so much more is going to happen for you. Yeah. But I think a lot of times we're stressed out of the bills you have to pay and the rent you have to pay. And I get it. Um, we didn't even get into this today, but I closed my last company in March and I didn't know what I was going to do. I just went to Maui for two weeks and figured it out. 
So I understand what it's like to not know where that that next dollar is going to come from. However, if you go into panic attack and thinking, how am I going to pay my rent? I got to get 10 grand this month. I don't know how I'm going to get it. If you come from that place, it's going to take you a lot longer. And by flipping it around and coming from a calm place of being prepared and helping and serving your other people, when you see an opportunity, you'll get paid. Trust me. So (laughs) that's that's really cool. And that I think people should check that out. We're going to have links to your site in the show note and to uh, the art of rapport page that you've got up there. People can check out more of your stuff. I hope your Instagram followers enjoyed the live event here that you've been streaming. Uh, Hello to all them from Kyle from Posify. Make sure you tell say hi for me. Yes, uh, Kyle says hi. (laughs) So you can't hear him, but if you do have questions, put them in the comments below and I'll answer them in five minutes. That's awesome. So thank you again, Michelle. It's been awesome having the Pitch Queen on the show. Again, links are in the show notes. If you head to proposify.biz slash podcast, you will get all the links. Uh, Thank you so much again, Michelle. Hope you enjoyed that chat with Michelle. Be sure to check out her links. Make sure that if you're not subscribed to this podcast, the Proposify Biz Chat, that you hit subscribe, whether you're in YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play. Make sure you check out more. We've got interviews coming. We've got uh, just awesome chats with just me and some people internally at Proposify. Some really cool stuff coming down the pipes. So hope you uh, come back and also share it with your friends and colleagues. That's all I've got. I'll see you next week. Bye for now.